Welcome to A Thousand Tiny Steps. I'm Barb Higgins, and in this podcast, I'll share personal stories of great joy and tragedy in the steps that brought me there. I have become adept at tracing them backward to find the origin of an event, good or bad, that has affected my life. I have gone from being on top of the world with Division I All-American success to being unable to get out of bed with the grief of losing a child and everything in between. I am painfully honest, which can make people uncomfortable, but discomfort brings growth and oftentimes tragedy brings joy. So tie, buckle, slip on, release up your shoes and join me as we begin our thousand tiny steps. Hey everybody, Barb Higgins here. Welcome to episode three of a thousand tiny steps. We are several hundred steps into the process of creating Jack Jack. Where we left off before was my return to Dr. Cardoni after an almost two year hiatus due to lack of money and our lawsuit. We had begun the process and then couldn't couldn't keep going because it was significantly expensive and we were still in the throes of grief. It was not a pleasant time for us. We are now at December 1st, 2018, and I have gone through a harrowing process of getting off all of the anti-psych meds I was on. And some of them, controlled substances, I guess would be a more accurate term, but lots and lots of anti-panic, anti-anxiety, help you sleep, make my mouth stop hurting, anti-anxiety, all of those. And, And you can't just stop taking them. And so it was a lesson for me, an unbelievable lesson in the strength and resilience it takes to become a sober person, whatever your, you know, your addiction is. So here we are December 1st and I'm having excruciating mouth pain. And I'm worrying that I won't be able to do this baby thing because I can't live with the pain. I have trigeminal neuralgia. And so I made an appointment with a man. I think I said this in my last episode, Dr. Askandar in White Plains, New York at Montefiore. And I had to have an MRI just to make sure that he could do the surgery. This is a bit of review. And so what happened was I had the MRI and I went home. And of course, you never hear from, you know, your doctor visits. If anything, if everything's fine, you hear nothing. When something's wrong, you hear something right away. And so it wasn't even an hour after I'd gotten home that morning, and that was December 10th, that I got a phone call. And the doctor on the other end was my neurologist, Dr. Tanase here in Concord. She's phenomenal, wonderful, wonderful woman. And she had treated my trigeminal neuralgia for years and, and, and thought that brain surgery was too big a risk to relieve pain, but I couldn't stand the pain. You know, it was, it was just a different method. And Dr. Eskandar was very, very good and world renowned for treating it through surgery and other, and other treatments. So she calls me and I have no idea why. And I say hello with trepidation because you just know, you just have a feeling And once you've gone through something like child loss, you really do start to pay attention to, you start, or at least I did, to all the little subtleties and things that happen. You think things are a coincidence, or you feel a hunch, or you have a nudge or whatever. And sure enough, she says to me, so it looks like we can see three brain tumors in your head. And I have it on speakerphone, and I'm sitting with Kenny, and Gracie's at school. This was her senior year. And all I can think is, I have to tell my daughter I have three brain tumors in my head. And the next thought was, The whole time I was fighting for Molly and trying to tell the doctors that something wasn't right, I had three brain tumors in my head. Nothing will bring Molly back, but I will say far more than being afraid for my safety and my health and my life at that time was the fact that Molly died of a brain tumor and had I known I had them and had shared that, the likelihood that she would have gotten more thorough treatment is profound. And so I I, I just felt incredible loss and frustration and sadness at that. It was very, very difficult. And all of these feelings come fresh off of every anti-anxiety medicine I've ever been on. So I will say at this time, my alcohol consumption was pretty consistent and pretty intense. You know, I tried to do all the right things, drink a lot of water, pick a number and moderate. My home drinking was well controlled, but still way too much. I never bought more than I wanted to drink. So those little teeny vodka shooters (laughs) were my bane back then. And I was just a disaster. I have this news and I have an appointment well, so the, the MRI gets sent to New York, to New York City, and I make a phone call to Dr. Eskandar to say, I have three brain tumors in my head. Can you please, can I still come? Because, you know, there was no brain surgeon in New Hampshire, perhaps at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. I want to rephrase that. I hadn't worked with anybody and I had started to develop a relationship with White Plains Hospital. So this was December 10th and my appointment was December 19th. So at this time, we were still pretty, pretty poor money-wise. My medical insurance at the time was Medicaid and, and how Dr. Eskandar managed to do what he did is, is he's a hero to me. And then I went, you know, I probably shouldn't say all this about insurance in a podcast, but I'm going to, I had incredible coverage. And then I have Ambetter, which is in New Hampshire. It's part of New Hampshire Healthy Families. And this, you know, I had to fight a lot on the phone and I talked with a lot of 
you know, people sitting at desks in offices, nowhere near my brain or my family, I was able to get a lot of treatment. So I'll get into that. So, so now suddenly I'm not thinking of a baby at all. I'm thinking of these tumors in my head and I was really just a mess. I had to go to a doctor's appointment, the initial doctor's appointment. Now it's me, Kenny and Gracie. We're just three people, like I said before, sort of living parallel lives in this house. Kenny and I can't leave her alone to go to New York. I, I felt very strongly that her life needed to stay the same. And this is what, after Molly died, I mean, I was, you know, in, up in the air so much about the status of my marriage and, and everything. You just want things to stay the same. When, when nothing is the same, we hold on to the same of things. And now five years away, we're still, we're still dealing with that. So at this point, which was now coming up on three years away, I just wanted Gracie to have as normal a senior year as possible. And it already was not normal and was about to get much worse. I also had a horrible falling out with a friend of mine. Her name is Robin. And we were, we had had falling outs before, and this is a big one. And, you know, to this day, we still haven't spoken. And that was right before my brain tumor. And she was a very close support to Gracie. And so when she disappeared, she disappeared for everybody. And I remember Gracie in her status on Facebook saying, you know, my, my second mother is gone. My sister's dead and that my dad needs a kidney and now my mother has three brain tumors. And, and I think back to that time for her and what her abject fear must have been like. It just must have been awful. And I don't know how else to, to describe the, the weight I had on my shoulders at that time. And really there was only one choice and that was to be as strong as possible. I'm going to flex here and show you my muscles in my tattoo. My friend, Deb Stanley, she is one of my best friends. She's seventh grade math. There's a group of us and we still get together. Bridget, Karen, Maggie, and Deb. And no... Not Bridget, Karen, Maggie, and Deb. Maggie's in a different group. It's Bridget, Karen, Barbara, and Deb. I'm not Maggie. At any rate, the four of us have just maintained a friendship. So when I found out I had the brain tumor, they, they were the first people that I told. So Deb lived in White Plains. She has family there. And she went to law school at Pace University, which is in or, in or near White Plains, New York. So she offered to take me. And how, how could I say no to that? So we got up early on December 19th, 2018, and drove to White Plains Hospital where we met Dr. Eskandar. And there's, if you go on montefiore.org backslash Barbara, they created a whole story about my experience to promote their brain center. So that's a good, that's a little quick, you know, two minute, they do these little buttons you push and you hear the interview and there's some pictures. So we, we meet Dr. Eskandar and he is kind. We're sitting on the other side of the desk. I bring up the fact, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I found these because I want to have a baby. And so he stops and looks at me for a moment and says, well, what kind of symptoms are you having from these tumors? And I said, well, I'm not having any symptoms from the tumors. And, and for me, I felt like I was very out of shape. I wasn't the fitness guru and the, and the beast in the gym that I was before Molly died. It was just too difficult. He did a simple neurological assessment on me and, and was a bit astounded that I wasn't having any symptoms based on the location of the tumor. My inner ear and my eye sort of straight in. What they thought they looked like was a class, stage one meningioma, which is if you're going to have a brain tumor, this is the one to have. And the thing with, with tumors like this is they don't often show up on CAT scans because they're the same color as your, as your brain. So it's like a, like a, a wart or a, or a cyst. You don't see it because it's not a different color than your skin, like a molar or freckle. They were not easy to see. You can see them on a CAT scan now and, and well, where they were. Once you know where they are, the tr a trained physician can see it. So at this time, it was all just news to me. So I said, well, would you do the brain surgery, please? Like, I can, you know, what do we have to do? I really want to try to have a baby. And, you know, TikTok on the age, I was 55 now. And, and and so that's the age limit. So, you know, now normally there, there are lots of things that, that were going through our minds at this time. Normally one craniotomy in six months is about all they'll do. And that was going to bring me to my 56th birthday. And I thought it would be too late. And we had to schedule the first surgery. So he said, well, what are you doing today and tomorrow? And, you know, Deb and I looked at each other and he said, if you can stay for a couple of days, let's get all the pre-op done. I went and had, and now granted, you can't do any of this through, you know, supportive insurance like Medicaid. I had no money at the time. We were just getting into a more stable situation for ourselves. And he was, he was able to make it happen, get all of this testing done. So I had two full days of all the pre-op chest x-rays and vision tests and all sorts of things to do with neurological function because they were going to go into my brain and take out a tumor. We got a hotel room in Manhattan. I thought, oh, we'll just stay in White Plains for the night and watch TV. And Deb said, no, no. So we had a wonderful time. We stayed at a really funky hotel, the name of which I'll never remember. And we walked around. We went to the Christmas tree. We went to a restaurant and we're waiting for a table. And so we see some people about ready to leave. And so we go over and stand just so we can get their table and come to find out this woman had an exact same tumor as me. 
same surgery. This is one of the many miracles. As I tell this story, some of the coincidences that happened to me are profound. And this is one of them. Finding the tumors in the first place was profound. And I remember at this time thinking, maybe I'm not supposed to have a baby. Maybe I was supposed to try to have a baby. So I would find these tumors. Somebody on the other side knew that I would never, you know, I wouldn't, I didn't know they were there. And so an, a wonderful part of this trip was meeting this woman. And she said, oh, that's exactly what I had. And she told me her whole experience and that she's fine. And her hair grew back and everything else. And she looked fine. And so that was of great relief. So we had a wonderful time. Uh, we met some really fun people at the bar at the hotel, you know, stayed up way too late. Morning came much too soon, but we drove back up to White Plains and I completed all of my testing and we drove home. I remember driving home. I got really, really bad vertigo and had to like put my head down. I was going to drive, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't sit up without getting really dizzy. I mean, that was some of the testing they had to do, you know, do all this really sort of wacko stuff and the movement of the car. It was a long ride home. Now here, here it is Christmas time. So we went to Disney, which is what we've done at Christmas since Molly died. We've gone to Florida. We've just gotten out of here and gotten away. We went to Disney. We did our thing. And so Deb, this wonderful friend of mine, she had an apartment at the time in Tampa. And we flew to Tampa and stayed in her apartment because she and her husband were up here in New Hampshire for Christmas. And so we just had fun. We didn't think about that brain tumor. We had, we just tried to have as normal a time as possible. And, you know, there's, I have this incredible picture. And once, once my podcast is more established, and, you know, I'm, I have, I've hired a web designer to put together. I have so many factions online, the foundation for Molly, my daughter, a website for this podcast. I have a blog site, which is a thousand tiny steps. Maybe that will be one. I hired an author to ghostwrite a book. I'll have web presence for that. So I'm a bit all over the place right now, but I will post pictures that correspond to these podcasts because I think it's important to see, you know, all the things that were going on. And one, one thing I've done is my hair growth. I have big poofy curly hair in the humid weather. And so I had a ton of it <laughs> in Disney. And I remember thinking, oh gosh, in 10 days, this could disappear. Having said that, Dr. Eskandar told me, don't cut your hair. So I went and got it colored. I spent a ton of money to make it look nice. He thought I would just have, no, I'm pointing to the side of my head behind my temple on the left-hand side. And he thought it would be a little circular scar or just a little scar. And he would go in and remove the tumor. So I didn't cut my hair. Had I known what was going to happen, I would have cut it all off beforehand. <laughs> Although it was interesting. So we go finally to surgery, January 10th. So we leave January 9th. It was an army of help for my sweet Gracie to, to be on her own here in Concord. My sister-in-law moved in for a few days. I was, I was gone for a full week. Kenny came down. He arranged dialysis nearby, near White Plains. He stayed at a hotel nearby. I was in the hospital, but it was a, you know, it was a six day hospital stay and a couple of days on either end. I had to wait a couple of days before I drove home to have some testing done. So we weren't sure in the beginning how long it would be, but we made arrangements for the week. So we left and went, drove to New York. So another little miraculous thing, we're driving to New York. We're on the Merritt Parkway, which is a a highway in Connecticut. Those of you who live in Connecticut know exactly what I mean. It has a route number. I think it's 15, but I'm not sure. And the traffic was horrendous like it always is. It's about a four and a half hour drive to White Plains from here. And we're in the traffic and I see a license plate that says Deb Tom. So Deb's husband's name is Tom, Deb Tom. That's what I see on the way to my surgery. And so I just felt like the universe was saying, it's okay, Barb, we got Deb with you too. So there we went. And I remember the night before just thinking to myself, why? I'm, I'm going to have my head cut open tomorrow. This is a big one. So we go to the hospital early in the morning. I go through all the pre-op. We take pictures. I'm trying to keep my family updated. Kenny's dialysis was in the afternoon. So he was going to miss when I woke up. So he wandered around all day while I was in surgery. I was in surgery for a long time. I think it was like really the entire day, about seven hours. What happened was, what they didn't tell me is when they really examined the MRI, they realized the size and location of the tumor was much bigger and more involved than they thought. It was really in, wrapped around my carotid artery. It was touching the optic nerve and the auditory nerve. You know, they were just, there was much more work to do to remove it than they had thought. It also was a much bigger scar. So when I woke up, the first thing they said was, okay, your scar is much bigger than we thought it was going to be. There was a lot more, it was much bigger. bigger. And I thought they discovered that when they went in, but they knew ahead of time. He's a very well-prepared surgeon. And he just said, I, there was no sense to tell you beforehand you were just going to worry, which is true. I fell asleep knowing everything would be fine. He was very reassuring. I don't felt like he kept anything from me at all. And so when I saw a mirror, I had a scar. Now I'm pointing. You can't see if, you, if you're just listening, but think of somebody with bangs and where the bangs start. That's where my scar is. And it starts above my right eye and it goes all the way across my head toward the left and down to behind my left ear or just on top of my left ear huge scar and it looked like a braided 
looks like somebody took my skin and braided it. It was just bizarre. My college roommate, Tanya, came. I have not seen Tanya since the 80s, really since college ended. But she lives in Brooklyn and all of my BU friends knew that I was going through this. And so Tanya came up and stayed. So when I woke up, I had her there, stayed overnight with me. So when I woke up and received all of this news, I was very much out of it. I was just in and out of being awake and all. My doctor asked me, who is Vinny? And so I looked at him. And, you know, it took me a minute and Tanya said that I was doing a lot of talking to people. And what happened was what I recalled at that time was this beautiful yellow light and these two dark shadows that would come together and go apart and come together and go apart, which I would assume would Dr. Eskandar and his assistant, although I don't know. And then I had, I had all these visitors. So I had five visitors. I had my daughter, Molly. I had another girl named Molly who died at age 29. I had Vinny who died in 2013 at age 18. I had Marilee and Jack. Marilee and Jack are both Molly's age. All of these children are children I met online in my grief groups. And what always draws me to a family is the child. There's hundreds of pictures of Molly in these grief groups because you post pictures, because you want people to know that your child was alive. And so I have this, I have a pretty close group. Vinny's dad, ER, Myers, Big Ed, he is a phenomenal support to people who have lost children. He's three years ahead of me. His son died in 2013. So he, he still has horrible nights. We all do. Marilee died in 2015, the summer before Molly died. And she was the same age. They were born a couple of months apart. And then Jack died about two months after Molly, my Molly. And then Molly died almost a year after my Molly. So the five of them were there and they were golden, I mean, black labs and dogs and all these things going on. And, and it was just, they, they were having conversations with each other. They were joking around. And I remember so much of the conversations, I recorded it in like, like on my phone so I could send it to these families. And the most wonderful response I got from this particular experience is that they all acknowledge that what I heard them say was exactly what they would say. So I don't know, you know, I know we all are entitled to, to believe what we believe and feel the way we feel about it. I will say as a mother with a child on the other side, I have to believe there is, because I can't, I can't wrap my head around the fact that Molly just doesn't exist anymore. She was so powerful and energetic and so much energy. I, I know her body's in a beautiful pink box, a mile that, a mile to my left, but I have to believe that her energy remains. And so this wonderful experience and Tanya took notes and asked questions. And it was in that scary time, it was a wonderful experience for me. And I remember it all. And in these five families, me, I'm the fifth family. So we're, we, we are very, very well connected. My hospital stay was relatively routine. I mean, as routine as brain surgery can be, I had a couple of days in the intensive care unit. And then, then I was put on a floor and I had my own room. And I actually got better much more quickly than I thought. I could get up and walk around. I will say so many hospitals, protocol, 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 protocol. White Plains Hospital has tremendous medical protocol. Nothing is missed. Everything is, every T is crossed and every I is dotted. What I loved about it was the willingness for the staff to engage as a human. It wasn't this private. I remember my husband, well, Kenny, <laughs> Coming home, from, coming home from the grocery store and he saw a dialysis tech at the store and she said, oh, I'm not allowed to talk to you. I'm not supposed to talk to patients. You know, and this is a dialysis tech that spends 12 hours a week giving somebody dialysis. That's a close relationship. It was such a refreshing feeling to have these doctors and nurses just be so utterly good to me. So good to me. So it was a five-day hospital stay. I had wonderful visitors. Joe LeMay came. He lives in, in Connecticut and he was a, he's a Princeton connection for me. I had some Concord folks come. They were actually on their way to go to a show in New York City. So they stopped by the hospital on their way. A mom and a couple of my bow runners, girls that ran cross country for me. I had some college friends come. One of my teammates, Donna, brought her children, one child. Maybe she came alone. I don't know. But she came to see me and it was phenomenal. I mean, it was just yeah, she came with her kids because my scar was all funky. You know, and then of course there was Kenny was there. You know, the, the week was survivable. I got discharged and I had a doctor's appointment. I got discharged on a Monday and I had a doctor's appointment Wednesday. So we just stayed, you know, so I was there Wednesday to Wednesday and then we came home. This is where things got dicey for me. I still had a lot of pain in my mouth, which is normal. I have a lot of uh, fluid and swelling in my head and they hadn't addressed my mouth. I was on heavy duty pain meds which I already was feeling bizarre. And I'm just so relieved that I had come clean with all the other meds before the brain surgery. Cause I can't imagine adding more, more of a narcotic type drug into what I had been taking prior. We put a mattress downstairs because up and downstairs was impossible. And I had no sense of balance or, or a sense of being inside myself at all. It, it's the most bizarre feeling. It wasn't painful. It wasn't uncomfortable. It was just bizarre. And I was exhausted, but me being me, I, I spent 
Thursday and Friday, pretty much in bed. And Saturday, I went out for breakfast with a friend. And that took all my energy for the day, I will say. The most outstanding symptom initially after that tumor removal was the fluid in my head. When I rolled over, I could hear it like a waterfall. Like you don't ever hear anything in your head. You know, it's full of your brain. <laughs> There's nothing to move around in there. It was the most bizarre feeling. And as, as time went along, the sensation became lower and then it was in my neck. And then it sort of just disappeared. But I'll never forget, you know, I'd roll over in bed and, <laughs> and it was like water coming. Oh my gosh, it was awful. So I slept on a mattress on the floor and I spent an entire month just going through drawers. I couldn't do anything. So I just sat and took a drawer, emptied it, threw things away, reorganized it, put it back. I, I, I organized bins and I had an amazing array of visitors. So many people came. I will say sometimes these kinds of experiences really do bring people out of the woodwork. But I wasn't done yet. I had three tumors and all they had done is remove the one on the left. The other two were on the right and they were too small to go in surgically to remove. My trigeminal neuralgia is also on the right. And I remember thinking, well, why can't we just do all of that at once? And Dr. Eskandar said to go into a brain and do more than one thing to it was far too traumatic for the brain. So I thought, well, okay. So he initially thought that my radiation would have to wait two or three months. So it wasn't like radiation, like melting radiation. It was more like radio waves that break things up. I went for my follow-up appointment and I was about two months ahead of anyone he had ever seen. I just, I just recovered well. And I think it's part of being a healthy person and part of you know my lifestyle. And I also just think it's genetics. I come from a family who lived well into their nineties on both sides. We scheduled the radiation for early, early, uh, late February, early March. And so I had to go have these special MRIs. The thing that stands out for me in this part of the experience is the, is the insurance company insisted I have the MRI here in Concord. But it wasn't an MRI that they were going to look at and do something with later. It was, I had to go across the street after the MRI to be fitted for a mask and have a practice radiation based on the MRI. And I remember sitting in my car trying to explain to the doctor, you know, why this had to be different. It, and it wasn't even, I, I just, I remember sitting, I, sitting in my car so frustrated, just in tears, not knowing could I even have this radiation with the surgery cover it, all of it. I needed all of this treatment, the MRI, everything. And I had Gracie in the car with me and, and, you know, they're trying to convince me, why can't you just do this part here? You know, like closer, like Portland, Maine or, or Burlington, Vermont or Dartmouth, Hitchcock. And I'm just thinking, well, I'm already in the middle of treatment with this physician. So I ended up getting it covered, but it was one of those things that any of you listening that have had an issue with an insurance company can relate to. It's just difficult to go through that. I'm very stressful. So we did it and we had to do the radiation. And I will say having your head bolted into a vice Felt like Hannibal Lecter a little bit, you know, but I had the I, lying on my back, you know, the thing on my face, you can't move. And it makes sense. They're zapping your brain. You don't want to move. It was really, really difficult. I wore this, a Molly B tank top, and I just tried to be still and be positive. They played 80s music for me, which was great. Actually, another connection, the doctor, the physician in charge of this grew up in Newton, Massachusetts and knew my college boyfriend's family. Newton is not a, a small town, but it's not huge either. Firefighters in his family and my college boyfriend's dad was a firefighter. So I remember just thinking to myself, okay, here's my connection here. I had one all the time. Another thing that happened a lot in this journey for me were the names of the nurses. Some of them were very unique names that you wouldn't hear all the time, like Taryn, T-A-R-Y-N. I had a nurse named Taryn. I have a Taryn in my life. I had a nurse who had two dogs, Molly and Gracie. You know, my daughter is Molly and Gracie. You know, I had, I had another, the, the chaplain that came to see me, her name was Mary Elizabeth, and that's Molly's birth name. So I had so many, so many just I call them God winks, you know, cushions, pats on the back from the universe that I was doing the right thing and I was safe and cared for. It was really, really wonderful. The radiation was seamless. I was moving along quickly. And so Dr. Eskandar scheduled my, my trigeminal neuralgia surgery for April 10th. So that's three months, January 10th, craniotomy for a brain tumor, April 10th, craniotomy on the other side for trigeminal neuralgia. This scar is much smaller. It goes from, it's on my, on my right side, from behind my ear, vertical, straight up to just above my ear. It's maybe three inches long, but I will tell you the pain was 9,000 times worse. And I think it's because the scar got into my neck a little bit. I, I had the surgery and he said it was very successful. I was a classic case, lots of irritation, inflammation in the arteries around the nerve. They sort of create pillows and they, they sort of gently move things out of the way of each other and cushion them somehow. I don't know. That's an easy way of saying it. I was still relatively bald and I had this new bald spot in the back of my head. And that was a shorter stay. And actually Kenny, Kenny didn't stay the whole time. He stayed, he got me there and stayed overnight one night. And then he went back to New Hampshire. So I was alone, but I had great company. Donna's wife, Linda came to visit me. 
This time I had a wonderful roommate. Oh, just a wonderful roommate. She, she was a cancer sufferer and, and she had had stomach surgery. So we had a wonderful time talking and, and trying to lift each other up and be enthusiastic. Again, tremendous care. And this time Deb came and got me, Deb Stanley. She was in Connecticut visiting her daughter. So she just came over from Connecticut, picked me up and brought me home. <laughs> Second time driving home from White Plains with Deb. So that was my health journey. I was told to take it easy. So two other things I did... <laughs> after these tumors and surgeries, after my brain tumor surgery, January 10th was the surgery. February 1st, I flew to Wisconsin to visit my good friend, Amy Farrar. She was my first ever babysitter. And I had planned to go much earlier and I had to extend out the trip. You know, so I went in a plane, traveled, you know, drove from the airport all the way to her house in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin. April 24th, which is Gracie's birthday. So April 20th. So 10 days after that operation, I we drove to Florida to Disney. Now I stay, was staying in a home, not a hotel. I had a comfortable bed and all of that. So it wasn't like I was in a, you know, hurting myself, but still traveling and going places and all. I didn't go on too many rides at Disney that year. And Kenny was so, so, so very sick. We pushed him around a lot in the wheelchair. This episode is a piece of the story of Jack, but from December 10th until really until April, the end of April, beginning of May of that year, there was no real thought of a baby because I was just swallowed up in getting healthy. I had several sort of weird symptoms that come with healing from two brain tumor surgeries. When all the lights were off and I had no sense of space, I, I sort of became paralyzed like I couldn't move. If I held onto something, somebody's shoulder or a wall, my proprioception became super crazy. I, I, could, I couldn't tell if I jumped, I couldn't feel my body in space at all. So at CrossFit, when I went back to the gym, <laughs> doing box jumps was impossible because once my feet left the ground, I completely lost sense of where I was. Even jumping up on a plate or a little teeny box was impossible for me. I had to do step ups. The other thing that was bizarre was my sense of balance going up and down. So any of you who know what a burpee is, you know, you jump down and do a push up, and then you jump up and jump in the air. It was like I was on a boat in a rough ocean. I would do one burpee and I'd fall to the ground, fall right over. If I flip my hair up, head upside down to wrap it in a towel after a shower, I'd fall to the floor. It was unbelievably profoundly scary, this loss of balance. Uh, it was just, you know, one of those things. Those were some of the things that sort of kept me in check as I was healing from the brain tumor surgery. So at this time, Kenny's getting sicker and sicker, and now we're coming up onto Molly's anniversary. So we're at Disney. I'm having a really bad brain day. I've got a giant, lumpy, <laughs> gross swollen scar and Kenny's sick with his dialysis. And so we're sitting by the pool and we're looking, I'm looking at Facebook, <laughs> big surprise. And I see that one of Molly's dance family friends has a daughter on life support at Dartmouth Hitchcock. And that's where Molly was. And it was the same time of year, end of April, beginning of May. And so I, I researched and I looked and her name was Rachel and she's a dancer and she danced in a duo with her sister, Allie, that year, I'd watched her dance several times and I just felt for this mother, I'm like, oh my gosh. So I reached out and asked, could, could we please be of help? They agreed, you know, well, I think, you know, when your kid's on life support, you're sort of in a daze. And her situation was that she was allergic to peanuts and she ordered egg rolls from a Chinese restaurant because that had always been a safe food for her. And that particular restaurant had either put peanut paste in or something that caused a reaction in her. She used her EpiPen, she used it again, it didn't work. In, in her situation, you know, she lost consciousness, they she stopped breathing, they got her back, they put her on life support. So she spent a bit more time on life support than Molly. Molly was five days. Rachel was, I think, almost three weeks because it was a bit less, it was a bit less obvious. And her and her brain damage from lack of oxygen was different than Molly's. Molly's was damage in her in her brain stem, which is all your life functions. Rachel's was lack of oxygen in the brain, not the brain stem so much, you know, we immediately jumped into action. So I'm wearing this Molly B shirt. We made t-shirts to raise money for their family. I can talk about Rachel. I didn't think I've talked about her, how her, her, her message in life was that it doesn't have to be a big thing to be somebody's miracle. So we made t-shirts for them and we sold those and sweatshirts and hoodies. And we've done a couple of rounds of those things. We put a meal train together. We would announce in the, in the fundraiser on Facebook. A lot of people just gave money and donations. And when we got back, we offered support. We went right up to Hanover to visit the family. And it was, it was grim. You know, it was just stressful. I just remembered what this was like. It was just brought it all back to me. And they had a lot, you know, they, they, Rachel was on paralytics, which would calm her down. Anytime they tried to take her off these medicines, she'd, she'd do this thing called myoclosis. And Molly did that, at, did that as well, just before she passed away. It's the nervous system sort of short circuiting and it's not a good sign. So after, after a lot of thinking and, and weighing the options, they decided that Rachel would have to come off life support. So this was pr profoundly sad for Kenny and I. I went back up to the hospital to see Rachel's mom, Jen, again, because this was a big, just a big thing. And I'm a mom that has unplugged my daughter. So I went back up and we visited and I hugged her and I went and said goodbye to Rachel and rubbed her fingers and told her to find Molly, 
find her, Rach, hang out, hang out together with her there. The other piece about Rachel is she danced in Molly's show. So she was in the opening number of Molly Be the Musical, which was how we how we honored Molly publicly. We had a private funeral at the gravesite, but we had a funeral that was called Molly Be the Musical and Rachel was in the opening number. So this is a huge connection. It's not just that they dance at the same school, but we have these connections. Jen in passing asked me, did I, had I considered, did I donate Molly's organs? Well, we weren't allowed to because they didn't know that Molly had a tumor until it had ruptured and killed her. So they had to send it out a pathology report to see if it were tumors, cancerous or not. It was not. It was an astrocytoma, one of the easiest tumors to pluck right out. So we did not donate any of her healthy, beautiful, perfect organs. And I said to Jen that that was frustrating to me because Kenny could have had her kidney. They were the same blood type. We were sort of devastated by that. And Jen looks at me and tilts her head and asks, what is Kenny's blood type? And I tell her his blood type. And she just goes, hmm. you know, and that was that. I went, you know, we weren't there talking. I wasn't there to talk about organ donation. So Rachel's birthday is May 7th, which is Molly's death day. So another one of these weird coincidences. And so Rachel turns 21 on May 7th. And we sent lanterns up to heaven to say, three years without you, Molls, we miss you really badly. Molly would have been... 16 at the time. I receive a phone call or a text message from Jen asking me about Kenny's kidney information at Mass General, who's his transplant coordinator. So I share this with, with Jen and I ask her why. And she says, we'd like to give Kenny one of Rachel's kidneys. They were the same blood type. I can't, I can't tell this one without crying because it's just one of these intensely crazy things that you can't believe are happening. So there we are standing at Molly's grave, knowing this family is in Hanover in the depths of despair, getting ready to say goodbye to their daughter who they unplugged on May 8th. And how do you be happy? You know, how do you be happy when you know that, that, that what's going to save Le Kenny's life is happening because there's a life that's lost. And, and this is, and this just goes right along with the story of my life <laughs> that with every, every wonderful thing is, is a tragic thing. The next morning, you know, we, we, we digest all this information. And the next morning we're getting ready to go to New York. May 8th, I had a doctor's appointment to check my head. And Mass General calls Kenny and says, you got to come down, you have a kidney. So everything was done. Now, I will say they tried to talk the family out of it a bit. No, you don't want it. We let us look and see who might be a best match and this and that. But it's their kid. You know, you have the right to decide who gets your organs if something happens to you and somebody you know needs them. You know, and so they were insistent that Kenny get one. So I drove to New York alone that day to get my brain checked. And Kenny drove to Mass General and spent the next week there, 10 days or so, maybe getting Rachel's kidney. So his kidney actual transplant was the 9th, May 9th. You know, May 7th, we celebrate and honor Molly's death. We say happy birthday to Rachel. She's 21. May 8th, her family makes the impossibly horrifying choice to remove her from life support. Rachel saved so many lives with her beautiful body. And then May 9th, Kenny gets a kidney. All of that happened in the span of time that I was, you know, going through the brain. So now it's May and May into June. Kenny's health is getting better. He has immediately immediate improvement in some areas. Um, he has some other complications that often go along with transplants. And here we are thinking, okay, should, so do, are we going to try for a baby? <laughs> so I got the okay. When I went for my appointment, I had an MRI and I got approved to, okay, you can, you can have an IVF transfer now. You can, you can try to have your baby. And there were lots of things to consider. Lots of tumors are hormonal. Mine was not. It was a non-hormonal tumor. Had it, had, had it been one of those brain tumors that's affected by hormones, there's no way I could have had a baby because it involves a lot of estrogen and progesterone and things that would make that impossible for somebody with this type of tumor. I mean, there was no malignancy for me. And Kenny was healthy now. He had a kidney and was feeling much better. So that was, so we're almost up to a year now from when I went back to the doctors after our lawsuit was done. In that year, extensive amounts of testing and extensive amounts of appointments and nothing to do with really making a baby. <laughs> well, it was all, due with, all to do with making a baby, but so much of our time was spent recovering from these operations. I think that's enough for this episode. This is, this is really all about the irony of finding out that I have these tumors in my head after really suffering through Molly's diagnosis and death. And then meeting a family through a shared tragedy who now is like family to us. I mean, Gracie and Allie are together a lot. They are very important to one another. The, uh, Dave and Jen and Kenny and I, are we visit all the time and communicate. You, you, can't, you can't go through this all of this and, and not be connected. Rachel's grave is, is right close to Molly's. I don't think I've gone to see Molly since this, since then without also stopping by to see Rachel. You can't see one without the other. So that's that. That's the, that's one of the other miracles of, of the story of Jack Jack. It's that in the process of at age 55 now, 
trying to have a baby. I had these medical tragedies and miracles occur in a, in a very, very busy five month span, 2019. So thank you for listening. I'll get much more into the technical aspects of Jack Jack himself or the process of Jack Jack and babies through IVF in the next episode. I'll talk specifically about what you have to go through to do this and, and how that process was for us. A lot of this was parallel with the brain stuff and the kidney stuff. A lot of it was done in the fall when I was going off all of those medicines. So that'll, that'll be a bit more for those of you who are really interested in the technical aspects of IVF, you know, fertility treatments and that sort of thing. I'll be much more scientific in that. So I'll end as always with try to do something nice for yourself today and be good to yourself. My, my nice thing tends to be going to CrossFit. If I can take care of my body, I somehow feel better about myself and I'm in a much better mood after I work out, but it's always nice to be kind to others as well. And thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for listening and for supporting a thousand tiny steps. I hope you enjoyed the episode and will continue to listen. Feel free to leave a review and share my stories with your friends. Also, please reach out if you have stories to share. I love hearing from and connecting with my listeners. If you would like to know what I'll be talking about down the road, you can find me on Instagram at Barb underscore 444, on Facebook as Barb Higgins, and at my website, www.1000tinysteps.com.